floor monitors or in-ears? The argument's gone on for generations, and trust me, it won't stop anytime soon. My mind has been changed because I've watched a master at work. Today, we're hanging out with Evan, who runs monitors for Sticks. This was a perfect show to find them on because it was one of the smaller venues that they had played. There were about 15,000 people that showed up to this particular show. They went on to play much larger scale stuff, but this is an interesting point where they could actually take time to talk to me because there wasn't as much to set up as their normal shows. Evan is a wealth of knowledge, but there's a lot of information here, just like the other video. So many things that they're taking care of behind the scenes so that the band is well covered for whatever happens. I was blown away by the level of technical expertise, mixing expertise, musicality required for a job like this, and it's wholly different than front of house, where you're really controlling the performance of the artist on stage, and it's not something that we get to see a whole lot of. Again, guys, this video has no sponsor. If you're liking this stuff, please hit the like button. Consider hitting the subscribe button because it immensely helps the channel out, and if you really want to support the channel, my affiliate link in the description below. Click it if you want to purchase anything. In this one, we get to see Evan talk about what it is that he does. We get to witness a sound check. We got to physically listen to in-ears from the band, which I can't show that, unfortunately, but it was mind-blowing. It completely changed my mind on in-ears. The level of consistency, the level of thought process here, the level of getting rid of variables to put on a professional show is inspiring. Buckle up, because there's a lot here, and there's more videos coming. Let's hop right in. Yesterday, uh, on the couches, uh, as far as my, my, my tools that I'm using on a daily basis, uh, we'll start with that because that's kind of an important part. Uh, I have the Audix TM2, which is the coupling microphone mm -hmm. uh, that hits my interface to the uh, Smart Live. So what we can do, run through my cleaning procedure daily. These are mine, mm -hmm. uh, Westone ES60s Customs. Uh, all the artists are wearing the same. Um, everybody's look a little bit different. Uh, that's what makes us all unique as people, right? Mm -hmm. So I uh, usually go through, if they're really dirty, you want to take a peek inside. Use a Jody Vac. It's a great tool to have for all you uh, musicians and monitor engineers out there. Just got to be careful with it. It goes in. It has suction. And you just kind of can get in and loosen up wax like such with it. That's step one of my procedure. Step two, I always use the Pharma C. Uh, alcohol wipes and <laughs> I like them as opposed to the ones from a first aid kit because they're much larger kind of like a Clorox wipe mm -hmm. so it gives you a little bit more control and you can get a couple sets done on one I also use these on my microphones uh, mm -hmm. as well doesn't do any harm so this would be the second step get them nice and shiny and clean so the next step in the process uh, is using the Audix TM2 you don't need to have a fancy interface here. You don't need to spend a lot of money on this. This is a regular old two-channel Behringer. We're gonna run around $100. I'm not looking for sound quality here, or I just need functionality for this particular thing. This is a piece that's lightweight, easy to travel with, um, and it's not gonna break your budget. So just an adapter off of this. Yep. From the headphone adapter, so we can hear our headphones, essentially. And what I'm doing is I'm looping out of the Behringer sending pink noise from the output and looping it back in as a reference signal, much how Cookie would tune the PA. So that <laughs> signal's always going uh, back into the system for monitoring. That's like our, that's our, uh, our standard that, we'll, that we want to observe. Then the microphone is going to be the other signal. And as we tap it here, you can see it yeah. red lighting on the smart screen. So pink noise only going through from the internal generator and we couple this on. And it looks like the gain's a little off there. So I'll just line those up so they match. Wow. Could have bumped it. And now you can see what I'm looking for here is consistency. So the original trace, if I were to turn this off for a moment, turn the generator off, turn this off too. This original trace here was my set of ears from about two months ago when they were new. So I just like to go through and we'll watch it and pay attention to trends and see if anything drastically has shifted. The phase trace up here is still pretty much exactly the same. That's great right there. Huh. Uh, so we know our cables are in phase. If it were reversed, uh, the line would go up one way or the yeah. down all the way the other. Um, and the frequency response is pretty close. Um, the reason I don't, I don't think it's advisable, especially for this use of the product, 
you don't want to be looking at the screen to make decisions for EQing the, the monitors. Right. These are really just a reference point for maintaining and making sure your drivers are working, essentially. You'll see right away, like I had one earlier, and I can pull it out and show you, um, where uh, it obviously has both low frequency drivers in the ear of the six drivers out, because it sloped off quite a bit uh, around the 125 hertz. Um, so it's just a useful tool to go through. Once they're done with that, they go back in the case, which is right behind you guys. I apologize for being scattered about today. We're kind of in a unique circumstance here with space. Yeah. Um, all the artists' ears go here. And everybody's running the same thing, right? The yep. So ES60s. It's, yep, all West Tone ES60s all the way across the board. Um, this is actually an old label on this one. It is an ES60 and as well as that. I just haven't done a new label yet. Brand new ears for these guys. Um, these four artists uh, take their packs with them in the dressing room. They'll get suited up uh, prior to the showtime. Summer months, we're using the uh, PSM 1000 rubber cover. A couple of the guys really sweat a lot um, in the hot season. And what happens is, is once the sweat gets down into the antennas and sometimes through the uh, headphone jack, it gets in and the pack will be functioning and you'll be seeing metering as if it's working. However, they'll just stop passing audio. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just a little extra protection for them. And uh, they kind of like it too because it uh, deadens up the sensitivity on the knob itself. It so actually takes a little more... Can't accidentally bump it and change yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. These, these roll pretty easily, so it's kind of a nice additional thing there. So that all goes in with the guys, all their ears. Uh, one of the gentlemen wears his on his strap. Uh, Chuck, our original bass player, does the same. And then this is the backup, which we'd spoken on yesterday. And we can take a look over in this world and kind of take a peek at how that all works. Sweet. But yeah, so that's the uh, that's the whole setup for cleaning and, and, and daily maintenance and daily uh, uh, component checks for the in-ear monitors. Um, now to the rest of the world here, uh, main point of focus, we're uh, running identical consoles, front of house and monitors, both Digico S12s. Mm -hmm. uh, we're running the 96 channel version of this console. Um, we have a shared stage rack. I have control of the head amp gain and Cookie just follows my lead on that. We, so is there a protocol when you're setting gain that you reproduce every time? So it, it, everything re, uh, recalls every single day when we start up. Rare that we are going to have to adjust a head amp gain. Yeah. Um, sometimes in emergencies, we don't change much out here once we have it dialed in. We kind of keep it pretty together for consistency for the guys. Yeah. Um, now, that being said, we will have some other artists performing with us. If I have to bring it in, we usually try to set screen here closed. We should try to set, you can see based on this is our, our stereo guitar rig for Tommy, right around the minus 10, minus 8, minus 10 area as a good place to be for most of our inputs. Um, some vary as we go along, but that's kind of a good uh, good starting point for us. And right now this is rolling a virtual sound check <laughs> yes, from sir. another show? Yep, this is our show from two nights ago in Columbus, uh, set up for virtual sound check. Just it's running a loop of the first song right now. I usually mute the vocals uh, that I have set up as a macro mute on my console. So I can just walk the deck and not have the vocals. And I can just kind of really listen in just on the mix. And, mm -hmm. you know, it gives me an opportunity to, to kind of listen to each guy's mix for more than just a few seconds at a time as I'm cycling through during the show. You know, if something like, oh, that seems alarming. And then I can go have a closer look at it later on down through the, the show. I run my whole show to snapshots. We don't run anything to time code. I am manually triggering all the snapshots as we go through the night. Oh. Um, mostly all that happens here is starting points. So it'll mute and unmute things on a per song level. Um, and then I have, uh, Digico calls them control groups. It's essentially a VCA for those folks that are used to that terminology. Yeah. Um, for a lot of my main things. So Tommy's vocal, Ricky's vocal, Ricky's bass and Tommy's guitar are there. And I, I, I am adjusting these the most throughout the night. Solos, uh, venue dependent, I have to adjust the bass level and the bass mix. Yep. Um, we also, this is a great one for uh, all you musicians and monitor guys out there. Anybody with a double pedal bass drummer that does big endings of songs, uh, I find it advisable to have your kick drums on a VCA. And I usually duck that down about eight to 10 dB at the end of the songs when we, he's doing the big rumble strip kind of ending. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're just preserving your singer's ears and stuff like that. I don't do it for the drummer himself because that wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Same thing, the bass player still wants to hear that. But for Tommy, for Lawrence, and for JY, those kick drums get, get ducked down at the ends of songs when it's big like that. Just every little bit we can do to sort of help their ears out. You know what I mean? Just consider it. Try to think of longevity, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, a, that's an important thing for younger people 
do. Uh, you guys, I, I, you want everybody to be able to play in their 70s and onward, you know? So save your ears while you can, you know? Um, so yeah, so that's all the same thing there. Uh, back to the game tracking. Cookie takes uh, a digital uh, trim off of it and it, it, it tracks the game. So if I have to go up a DB on a channel, simultaneously, seamlessly, without him even knowing it, It'll turn it it's down. correcting it down Aww. in real time in 10th increments. Oh, so 10th geez. of a DB increments. Uh, it's seamless. You wouldn't even notice that I'm turning the knob. You can turn that functionality off, should you? But we do it that way just in case I have to grab something quick. I don't have to send him a message on the console. This is how we communicate these days during the show. It's kind of like AOL Instant Messenger from back in the day, but it goes through the console's fiber optic network. <laughs> and we can just touch it and I can just be like, hi, you know, something to that extent. And he can respond to me that way. Really useful tool. It doesn't distract me from having to listen to the mix. It doesn't take his time, like having the old telephone days with the clear comm. That's the thing of the past for us. Um, it just makes it, it's, it's little things like that that we really are fond of. Um, mm -hmm. Set up my console, uh, very unique to me. Um, I do have other layers that are one-to-one -one according to the input list. So should something happen to me and someone needed to come in like, oh my God, Evan's sick. Uh, Jeremy, we need you to mix the show tonight. You could look at our input list and walk up and just go click on that and you'd be able to navigate it through. But mm -hmm. it, even, even the way I do it custom, it's still pretty self-explanatory. Um, I do all my custom layering on the third layer of the console. Um, and then I have four banks per layer. So the stuff I'm doing the most fader moves for, um, is on the first page so that's my vocals uh the guitars and the piano and synthesizer just keep in mind i've got my uh kicks hats and ride right here and mm -hmm. then the, the the tommy channels and ricky channels here at all times if i switch a bank so on the right side here is my auxiliaries for the the main band members mm -hmm. then the wills uh our new band member and then the techs are down here chuck's our original bass player but notice the control groups are the same so if i have to go between here I never have my fingers yeah. not on the most important channels. They're huh. just copied right down there. Um, and I find that to be helpful for my workflow. Um, and then also another thing uh, is with this system, I have another layer buried in the console where everything that is on this side is over here and mm -hmm. everything that's on this side is over there. That way, should one bank of faders have a catastrophic failure mid-show, get back. I can. It'll be more button push, pushing to get from point A to point B, but I can at least still mix the show and not have a, a, a show-stopping moment where the artist notices. They would be none the wise to do it going down, and I'd be having my Jeez. mini crisis over here on my own time, and <laughs> I could still keep it going. Um, and that it has happened. So it's a it's a thing. Um, cool cool things that I love about the flexibility of this platform. Um, on these screens here, this is all run by an, an old, everybody loves to laugh at me, my old 2012 Mac Mini, uh, <laughs> which I'm running Windows on, and there's a whole story behind that too. But we're uh, boot camping <laughs> Windows on that machine. Yeah, you are. And one screen <laughs> is handling wireless workbench, which was yep. the, well, my essential tool in my toolkit for every show that I do yep. as a monitor tech or engineer. Um, and then the other side is doing Waves Tracks Live, and then the Waves q -Rec, uh, And that's how I'm doing my multi-track recording and play virtual soundcheck playback every mm -hmm. day, which is as simple as push of a button. Now I'm live back to the band. Now I'm listening to last night's show. Gosh, I, man. And it just drops everything right where it belongs. Super useful tool when trying to dial in your mixes, or uh, you might get mix notes from your artist after a show, and you can come back and listen, or uh, you could something could go wrong during a show. There could be a buzz and you couldn't find it right away. Well, it printed to the record uh, post head amp, so we can go back and find all that stuff. And it really helps for uh, both dialing your dialing your mix in as well as troubleshooting. Um, and speaking of dialing mixes in, like these mixes are completely independent from each other. Yes, because you're doing something completely different. Yep, and you're serving a different purpose. Yep. Now, I think most of us when we're using in ears, we're used to just taking basically the raw, pre-EQ, pre-effects, pre-whatever on a board, and that goes to our ears. Like a mix from front of house kind of yes. vibe? Yeah, sure. So what you're doing here is definitely more controlled. Very controlled. And it's uh, I'm, I have 12 in-ear mixes 
I have a couple of wedge mixes, um, and then I have hardwired mix for our drummer, which is a Shure P9HW. And if you've ever seen Todd Zuckerman's Instagram, uh, the videos that he posts, up, posts on his socials uh, from his Zoom camera all have their own dedicated mix that comes out of the console to that as well. Mm -hmm. Also a Shure P9W. Um, so there's a lot going on and everything's radically different. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I snapshot mix. Well, all the songs have various things in them. I do a lot of changing from pre-fader to post-fader. And my uh, reasoning for that is I try to do all my moves on faders. I, I try to keep the minimal minimal knob turning. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that way I'm just kind of feeling it and watch eyes on the artist at all times. Um, that being said, there might be a song where uh, something needs to get louder for artists one, two, and three, but four, five, and six don't want it to get louder. So it just, it alternates through. So not some, sometimes <laughs> it's free, sometimes it's post. Um, cool thing I like about the Digico as well, uh, you can have a feature called pre-mute on it, which our techs all have their artists' guitars and things in pre-mute function. So if we're on an electric guitar song, and we have a, an acoustic song for Tommy coming up. Scott can be here playing the okay. acoustic guitar while the band's on stage and no one else would hear it okay. until the next snapshot fires and then it unmutes that. Um, super That's great, handy. great feature for the guitar technicians. Wow. Um, you know, it, back in the day, I used to be on a Yamaha PM5D for a long time. Still love that console to this day, um, but I couldn't do that. So it would be like guitar tech waving at you, pre-fader listen, give them a thumbs up, you're good. Again, now I don't take I don't think about that anymore. I'm on, on eyes on the artist, listening to the mix. Super cool. Man. Um, so the next tour of the uh, the upper level, uh, my playback machine for samples and stuff that we have uh, from one of the more recent records had some space sounds and whatnot. So uh, for when we play those songs, there's a click that goes to it, and then those samples just pop up there. Mm -hmm. um, that comes through uh, a USB cable straight out of the computer. And on the back side of the Digico, which we'll check out in a second, it's USB right into the back of the console. Uh, and it's only on certain models they make, but it's called UB Maddie. So it's a, a, a USB 2 to MADI conversion, and you can do 48 channels bi directional at 48K. Oh, wow. We run our show at 96K, auto sample rate conversion all within the console. So we, we need not worry about a thing. Ooh. Front side still, just a keyboard for the console, keyboard for my computer living there mouse for that computer as well um nice. underneath uh under the hood here uh our entire system is sure axiom digital and psm 1000 mm -hmm. um we are at a total of 32 channels um 32 channels of rf so i've got a 12 pack of the in-ears all stereo and then uh, i have four Axiom Digital Microphone Sticks handhelds. We're putting Beta 58s on those? No, no, I'm sorry, regular SM58s on oh, okay. two of them, uh, as we have regular SM58s across our front line. And then we have uh, KSM8, uh, both hardwired and capsule on a stick for our piano player. Okay. Um, so he'll jump off the riser, as you guys will see. He runs around with a wireless as well. Um, so those, that's just what we liked for his vocal. Sound yeah. Great. Um, so, that's pretty much the front end of it. Everything's networked together. All the coordination's done. I program all everybody's wireless every day for them. Uh, they don't need to worry about it. Guitar techs just sync up and go, and I'm monitoring it throughout the show. So um, easy. Today is one of those days. You know, we're at a fair today, so there's uh, quite a bit going on around us. It's not just all about our world. So we had a whole bunch of other wireless frequencies that are in use already at the fair. And with wireless workbench, it's easy. It's just going into exclusions, and you set up. Uh, frequency specific or frequency ranges to avoid and then you can run your scan and it'll coordinate and calculate everything based on that so definitely helpful the the days before this i i try not to remember <laughs> you lost it Once again, drum assignment. all right tommy guitar coming at you That's good for me. Main somebody, RF somebody vocal. Play some B -bird. One, two, main RF vocal. One, two, main RF vocal. You want vocals? Three, four. Acoustic is good for me. Oh, acoustic. Good house. 
Spare F vocal is good. Yep. Will R F vocal mic. Will R F vocal is good. This is Will R F vocal. Will guitar is good on stage. Will guitar is good, house. Banjo. Is it supposed to sound like that? No, kidding. Yeah, it's good. Keep going for a second, please. Don't you know like any old Kentucky bourbon or anything like that? Oh, some of them, the classics? You gotta learn that shit, man. <laughs> it's, got, it's got enough strings for you. Okie dokie. J Y guitar. J-Y guitar is good, huh? J Y guitar is good on stage. Will Acoustics is good, huh? Good on stage. Bass coming at you. CP bass, good for me. Good house. Okie dokie. Go uh, pretty tight up here. Thank you. Yep. P1, good on stage. Good Good, house. good on stage. Organ is good. Organ is good, house. Jupiter is good. Jupiter is good for me, thank you. Jupiter is good, house. Good for me. Uh, stage left vocal, one, two, good. stage left. Center vocal, one, two, center good. vocal. This is stage right vocal, good. one, two. The piano vocal, one, two. Good house. Three. Okay, now we're done, right? Indeed. Okay. I'm surprised listening to Todd's. I was it's naked. Yeah. It's it's all it's super it's, it's, interesting. It, it, it's like you're sitting in Madison Square Garden yeah. and you're playing like a, a solo. But ever what seems quiet to us in that mix, he hears. And like mm -hmm. his moves are real small for the most part. Small moves, his solos fall. You probably noticed, you know, on, on guitar solos for Tommy, his moves probably are about a dB to two dB, depending on the song of a push. And then that affects his mix. Actually, his guitar solos go in everybody, up in almost everybody's mixes all the time. There are a couple instances when it doesn't, yeah. um, but for the most part it does. Um, and it's real subtle. So that's not where I was saying, you know, I get everything kind of dialed into the mix and on certain things it'll be post fader, certain things it'll be pre fader, just to sort of, have that that control over it and that's a that's a lot of trial and error you know that's a lot of, a, a lot of doing it and then realizing oh wait how can i utilize the console to minimize the amount of moves i physically have to do you know the, the less less scrolling and things like that just try to keep it all on that main page and try to i, I have a really analog mindset about it so and, and i i was shocked with how good it sounded i mean not, i don't mean to sound like i expected something bad yeah yeah, yeah. just my background with in-ears sound nothing like this yeah it's not even in the same planet they uh like, they're a great i mean a great band is always the key yeah a great band is always the key to having a great monitor mix or front of house mix um and they like it to rock and <laughs> it's, it rocks. it's, it's like, a lot of fun it's it, a really fun show to mix it feels good like how are you, you're, I'm assuming you're doing the, like EQ compression effects. Oh yeah. Like. So uh, I've got a whole rack of effects I use. Uh, that's all internal on the console. I don't run oh, anything wow. external. I'm not running external waves. Uh, I use my Waves card and a Waves MGB to tackle my multi-track recording and virtual sound check. But that's the only Waves stuff I have. So all the other stuff's on board. Um, basically, each artist has their own room. So I'm trying to give it like a like a like if they're in the studio kind of feel for however dry or wet or like just the reverb times the reflections just to cater to like their sound. And you um, felt that too, like yeah. switching, like you could definitely. Like, I mean, maybe I'm mixing them up in my head, but Tommy's felt very like there was space, a lot of space in it. Um, you know, and we're putting I got the stereo guitar yep. for him, so it stays right up the middle, but we actually have it gain just slightly offset. <laughs> uh, so the opposite guitar yep. in his mix sits like that and that also is a benefit for the front of house desk as well um and then uh i'm just using basically the i'm sort of emulating a tcm 2000 uh yeah. standard room reverb on it for them Gosh. um and then i uh, got some delays i punch in for some guitar solos not all there's a few where we let, like just like it's super wet in the in your mix so i have a macro on the console that just takes the delay let's see here um Boom. So yeah, it just brings up the 10 tap delay and I, it 
uh, is snapshotted as well, so the parameters follow whatever the song is. And when I engage that, I can just thicken up and really, that adds a nice, a little bit of more depth to his solos as well, kind of yeah. makes him feel really big. Um, but aside from that, pretty much just room, mixes with rooms, you know? Um, I have uh, an enhancer, uh, which is kind of a, I don't know what I would compare it to. It sort of like reminds me almost like of a TC finalizer, but it has a crunchy mid compression on it, compression on the lows, and then an enhancer on the high. I use that in the snare drum, and that really like brings it to life. Like a little um, bit of saturation. Yeah, type pretty of stuff. much. Now everything on the console too. You know, you can get they they call them digi tubes. So they have a little thing right at the top of the console yeah. in the channel strip. Uh, where you have a drive and a bias on the tube you can turn it on and off they also have a warm you can just have it be warmer um a lot of really pro high-end consoles now have something similar to help the digital get a little bit of a little bit of fat like and saturation or whatever yeah the, the equivalent yeah. of heat would be okay. on the avid system yeah okay um definitely helpful uh i don't use it on everything but where where i do use it it makes a difference and it just kind of i mean you can hear it and in, in the end you can hear it it is interesting, like so many of these things make life so much easier, but we go back to wanting to hear those old systems yep. and so many different things, and it makes complete sense. When I switched, I've tried, I've, I've had different consoles with this band over the years, so we were on the Yamaha platform for a long time, and they are, were very used to that. So when switching over to this platform, it was a challenge. Uh, it was a big challenge. It was all, this was a lot cleaner. So I had to like dial in some of that grit that we were missing from the Yamaha, which was really desirable, especially on like, you know, your percussive instruments and the bass and stuff like that. That little bit of crunch was really yeah. huge. Um, so Yamaha. I had to kind of just bring it back in with this to give it some more, some more spank. Um, but definitely that. Every channel, you know, we got compression, EQ, every channel, all standard. Uh, what's cool about this platform, do you guys remember the old, I think it was like the BSS 901 maybe? It's an old uh, uh, para, uh, dynamic equalizer. So you can have a dynamic EQ on every channel if you want, in addition to a multi-band compressor, compressor three band. Um, oh, wow. All per, that's all standard right within the platform. So we have a lot of, a lot of tools at our disposal just in the console alone. Gosh, I'm used uh, to, Yamaha and this looks this feels way better yeah for for my workflow and what our our goals were when we migrated this way it was really the logical choice for for us um, I'd like to now move upwards with them to a, one of their quantum series consoles that would be that has a whole new t set of tools in it um, like the uh, the nodal processing which essentially makes it like each artist almost has their own console they can have their own dedicated uh, dynamics and compression on a per channel level. Holy so God. every artist can have different EQs and dynamics on every single input should they need that. Um, so that's like the future of where I hope to migrate. But for right now, this has a very, been a very solid package and it makes them very happy. And then uh, I was uh, get back to earlier, I want to show you guys the backside so you can kind of see the oh, yeah. the whole mission control of it all. Um, Might have to. I'm totally, yeah, and you guys can feel free to come up, whatever works better for you guys. Um, I'm very much uh, into to, to teching it out and trying to keep it clean. I apologize, my laptop cable in here, this is not standard. These are just kind of come out once in a while. You have things. two cables in your apologize. Um, so <laughs> it's so clean. In the doghouse, you know, the Mac Mini that I said runs these two, it's just simply powered by USB monitors. These are uh, not very expensive, lightweight and easy to carry. I rigged up a setup with a little boom stand in there and there's an LO2 yeah. so I can quick disconnect it and drop these down. I'm not so much of a fan of arms and doohickeys all sticking out. And oftentimes we're performing on festivals or with other bands and changeover times are essential. So I like to have it set so I can break everything between it and nothing else needs to be done. Push it out to a loading dock or out of a venue, out of an arena into a hallway and I can break down away from everything. Uh, and it just expedites the changeover. So for wow. consideration for other artists and what have you. Um, so yes, yeah, so the Mac mini there, taking care of the workbench. This side of it is the Waves Tracks Live. So as I mentioned before, we're running at 96K. So uh, we have a, uh, DigiGrid MGB is my first 64 channels of I.O. for the recorder. Yep. And then I daisy chain that through the Waves DMI card, which is an option card on the back of the uh, many of the Digico consoles. Yep. Um, and that handles 64 and uh, onward um, mm. for the playback and, and uh, uh, virtual sound check and all that. 
just have a two bay toaster dropped in here. Uh, I have a SSD, mm -hmm. which is always the recording drive. And every morning I dump whatever the previous show's recording was onto an archival drive uh, mm -hmm. and then wipe, wipe the master. And that just lives in there all the time. The drives just live in a, one of the drawers cases as we travel. Um, on the local IO side, just my talkback mic and audience mics. And then I have a pair of XLRs here I can just whip out in case uh, we have a guest uh, guitar player or something like that, or if there's a support act with a solo acoustic I need to handle. Our stage rack is full. So down here we've got red and orange are the inputs all from the drums. Mm -hmm. Yellow is all of the stage right stuff. So all the keyboards uh, as well as the stage right guitar player will. His inputs come in here. Green is all of the stage left guitars. Blue is the downstage hardwired vocals. And then over here, uh, the unlabeled one here is gray, actually. This is the hardwire in-ear return for our drummer. So there's six lines that go. There's a main left and right for Todd. There's a spare left and right for Todd that goes to our drum tech, Mark, that he also listens to. And then there's Todd's video camera mix uh, as well, all in that six pair. The last six pair over here is uh, additional inputs. We take the guitar lines directly off of the switcher into the recorder. Should they ever want to do something, they could always reamp it in the studio. So we're literally getting the raw guitar printed awesome. every single day. <laughs> um, and then uh, other than that, just the amp rack. So this is uh, the small speaker center stage. Uh, that's the gentleman that only wears one in-ear. So we put a little bit of guitar, a little bit of kick snare hat in there, and the tiniest bit of keyboards. It's a vibe thing for him. My other wedge mix is the 12 TLS right here. This is solely used as a sustaining wedge at the end of one guitar solo. And then you'd so asked can... about, yeah, okay. just to let the note hang. And, uh, and he does, you know, the foot goes up on the wedge. It's a, it's a move. Um, <laughs> and then to answer for your question from yesterday, yes, if uh, we had a, a disastrous situation, I could always change my EQ at the push of a button and then make it be where I could pump, pump a full mix through this wedge. But it, that's the only real thing on stage. And then there's a drum sub, which is really just the bass drums in the larger toms and the gong drum in that. Huh. And that's, so that's all the loud on stage that I have. Everything else is... There's a lot going on, but it's so concise and controlled at the same time. Like, Everything networks through here. So I've got a network switch inside the rack that you can't see. And then these are all of my Ethercons for all of the Shure wireless um, mm -hmm. for the guys stage right, the two guitar guys. Everything's all together with a cable so I can monitor change and, and program on a daily basis very easily. Um, that's really it. That's, that's the rig in a nutshell. <laughs> That's quite the nutshell, my friend, dude. And then it's lots of uh, accessory boxes that keep things in it, you know? Um, this one here is utility, so I keep my laptops for playback in here. Uh, extra little, like, you know, thumb drives with backups of the information on it. Mm -hmm. Extra IEM packs. I usually leave my microphones in there. Extra IEMs, IEM cables. I've got some spare faders for consoles in case we have a fader yeah. failure. Yep. Um, and hard. this is normally hard drives, and it's got a little bit of junk in there right now. Um, this side over here is the mic box. So top drawer is all drum mics. Mm -hmm. So that gets taken out every day and just carried up there. Bottom is all the drum cables and the shock mounts for the overheads. This is my vocal mics, audience mics, and then spares uh, for the drums. Wait a minute, can, can we just appreciate this sticker right here? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All of my fish friends that see this are going to be calling me, man, what's that about? Same. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We love them too. Um, next door down, just some extra spare, like, you know, 58, uh, spare KSM-8, um, things like that. So this is sort of just the uh, not necessary right by me every day. We can put this one wherever. Uh, the antennas travel in a cube here. And uh, then I've got the power distro and I've got one cable box somewhere that all my stage looms snake in and out of. You know, I, I have very few loose XLRs. I'd like it to be quick. So pretty much the trunk opens at the end of the night and I pack it back in exactly how it came out every single day. So drum loom in first, mm -hmm. sandbags, and it just layers in just like a, like a cake, you know? <laughs> Love it. So we just did this recently for Scott, made a nice panel. Um, all the guitar signals from Greg's rig come into the panel. They meet up and merge with Scott's stuff and it comes out here. And then this is the other, the dry guitar signals and a couple uh, spare lines to get it to said stage rack over there. Um, it used to be whips uh, that had like a lot of zip ties and XLR connections in there, but yep. I took the time to custom pin a panel so it just looks cleaner. And, uh, and these are, what is that connector called? Is this that's, an, the drum? that's an old school amp G connector. Um, G1 would be the six pair, G2 is a 12 pair, 
And they're few and far between seen, but they did do a G3 as well, which was probably 20, 21 pair? 18 pair. I think you can get an extra channel in there, though. So I think there is, like, there's enough holes for a 7th channel, should you have had that. So I think it was 21 channel, but people always do them in banks of 6. That's the most standard. Um, you don't see them a lot anymore, but I love right. them. They're really easy to pin and, uh, and repin and fix. Uh, they're very serviceable, unlike, you know, as much as I love LK, um and, and a lot of the other screw style multi-pin connectors yes. these never spin um there's I, I they're simpler and sometimes i think simpler is better and i've never seen these because i use the screws a lot and they seem like they always fail and they're hard to fix yeah if you take but... like a veem style <coughs> excuse me and if you drop a veem style onto the concrete you could knock it out around and it will never made up and it's yeah. very or if a burr gets into that slot the pin and slot and that it, just things i see over time um biggest problems these run, run into is sometimes a pin will push back but it's a matter of just taking your needle nose and pulling it straight pulling out. It right out it's not like a whirlwind w series with the real fine pins that break if they bend yeah these are a pretty robust pin you can check it out right here if you want to get a look in there let's see it's a oh, pretty wow. robust pin that's spaced out pretty well huh and push to connect just like that occasionally the latches they'll get beat up over time and breaking you swap latches out but again two screws couple minutes it's like changing a, changing a tire you know he's super cool this is the part i feel like we didn't get a see last time this is oh. really interesting right, don't really bother, rope. okay now anyway yeah. let's, let's go find a distro i want to show you guys that what we were discussing yesterday <laughs> yes hello <laughs> excuse me so so here's a good example of what i was talking about yesterday so you see there's two rows to the cam locks yeah uh the top row doesn't have an output on the blue side on top. That's probably because they're running single phase with just two legs of power at 240 versus three phase. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the bottom would be the input uh, and the top is the output. Sometimes what you see people do, I'm not going to demonstrate it because we are powered and we don't want to do this. Some people would, instead of using a gender bending turnaround for the ground and neutral, green and white, the inputs, they would put the, the input ground and neutral on the top row and then the remainder actual power line three phase on the bottom row. So then as an artist coming in to said festival or event, you would have to then somehow use a turnaround to put your ground and neutral on the bottom row and then your outputs on the top row. So you're, you've now done this, you've crossed yep. the cams. And let's say, let's say I patched it in the morning and you came in to unpatch it in the afternoon and you didn't know. Did the wrong one. Then you've pulled a neutral and a ground for the entire operation which is a huge hazard. So <laughs> a lot of people balk at like, oh, why am I why am I on this crusade against this? I just think it's <laughs> consistency and safety and I'll always plan for, for standardization. It's yeah. just a thing that we, we were raised on it. I'm so glad you gave him time to get this off his chest because we're kind of tired, tired of hearing about it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a daily thing, but hey, it was right today. So I was super yeah. happy. That was a good start. <laughs> we need to get it on a t-shirt. We'll right? Sure. There you go. <laughs> Don't cross the cams. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it in a nutshell, guys. Thanks, man. I can give you these ears back.